we are continuing our series with the title of Watch Your Mouth. Now, we had a little fun with it last week because I gave you some practical examples and some thoughts that I think everybody could relate to. And I don't, this is something that's off script, not in my notes, which is how most things that I say tend to be. Um, but for some reason or another, this has been heavy on my spirit since last night. So I'm going to share it because apparently I need to. When coming up with the title for this message, the Holy Spirit, of course, gave it to me. And I know some people look at titles and they look at messages and, you know, I don't know. I don't know what goes on in everybody's mind as to why we come up with the messages we do or why is the Holy Spirit leading us in that direction or not. But I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the reason he is having me share this particular subject matter with you is based upon my heartstrings toward you. You hear me at the end sometimes, you know, I have the standard benediction that I give, and a lot of times, especially like on Thursday nights, I may say, I love you with the love of the Lord. And I think sometimes people tend to take that sort of like when you go up to somebody and say, hi, how are, you know, hi, and they go, oh, I'm fine, how are you? You know, it's just a standard little cliche. And I think sometimes people think that. Well, I want you to know that if I say that, it's because I truly do mean it. And the reason this subject matter is so important to me is my husband and I have been following the teaching of Apostle Frederick Casey Price a little shy of 40 years, which is a long time. And any of you who followed his teaching for any length of time, you would hear him say something like, they didn't have a pot to cook in. That's an expression he uses. Well, when we first started hearing him and learning about the word of God through him, I can say that we did have a pot <laughs> and I was cooking, but I didn't really have much to put in the pot. <laughs> okay, so for me and for both of us actually, we clinged to every single word that we learned. We reared our children that way. When we first started hearing about the apostle, we had two children. We now have five. We now have three grandchildren and another one on the way. <laughs> so the point being is we have based our lives upon the word of God. And we learned and we continue to learn because that's our choice. We want to learn every day that we live how to become better better servants because we serve at the pleasure of the Most High God. And one of the things that I learned back actually in 1983, I will never forget it, is that my words, they're all right, <laughs> but they don't really mean a hill of beans if I don't know the word of God and if I cannot say it is written. If I don't know his word to stand on, I can't expect or think that there are going to be any changes in my life. And I've learned that what I want in this life is literally in my mouth. And that's why, ergo, this message was born. Have any of you ever had someone ask you the question, what is your five-year plan? Or where do you see yourself 10 years from now? Has anybody ever had that? Yeah. I'm the only, there's three or four? Nobody's ever asked you that? Okay, great. Have you ever even thought about it yourself? You know, because when you go and you have a job, certain jobs do offer us, you know, retirement plans and 401ks and all that, which is good. They're good financial vehicles, that's wonderful. But what happens if you were a homemaker and you never had a 401k? And now you're approaching the age where it's like, wow, uh, I need to maybe have some money to kind of really live. And I really didn't put a lot away for a nest egg because I was really trying to be the homemaker and take care of my children. And 
you know, or maybe my husband was a tradesman and maybe he didn't work for a big company and maybe he didn't have all those financial vehicles. What are we supposed to do? These are questions that a lot of people who are over the age of 50 are asking themselves these days. And of course, the world doesn't have any answer and you will have some people who will actually laugh at you that you didn't have a 401k. You should have figured it out. You should have gone and found one. You know, I mean, all kinds of things like this we are faced with. Um, <laughs> And here's the thing that I'm so excited about, is that we don't know what the future holds. We can't see the future. I don't care if you have two or three 401ks, which you're not allowed to have, by the way, but whatever. <laughs> Doesn't matter what your retirement plan is, you could have socked away a million dollars. Let me explain, and you already know how this world is because the God, that Satan is the God of this world. Your million dollars will not be enough because it constantly, you need more and more and more and more. So the point that I'm making to you is we as believers can just relax. We can just rest in him knowing that whatever we need, whatever we want, it is in our mouth. Because the promises of God, as we've been sharing throughout this series, are what? Their voice activated. And when we speak, whatever it is that you speak, you are going to eat the fruit thereof. So the point is, just understand that, be excited about that. Don't let anything at all even have any kind of negative effect on you. That is definitely just a trick of the enemy. So the good news is we are going to do what? We're gonna watch exactly what comes out of our mouths. That's what I want because then, do you realize if we all really do this, and mature in this area that we can have whatever it is that we want. So if we can have whatever it is that we want, we literally can just take this city by storm because we can speak that we want souls to be saved. We can make a difference. We can do some things, but we've got to understand this. And I know that by large, all of us pretty much do. That's why you're here, because you're always trying to glean all that you can from the word and grow, and that's a wonderful thing, and God is honoring that in your lives. But I want us to go up the next step, the next rung on the ladder. I always want us to be the best that we can be. And as wonderful as we all are striving to be, we haven't arrived yet. We got to keep going. We have to keep going. So we're going to go back to some of the things that we said last week. Some of them were a little comical, but some of them are things that people say all the time. One of them is, have you ever heard anybody say, you know, that person, whoever it is, is a pain in my neck? Oh, everybody's heard that, right? Okay, we don't think anything really of it, but then all of a sudden we don't realize it might not be that day, it might not be until a month later you start having a pain in your neck. Because what have you done? You actually have released that and you've spoken it into existence. Another thing is, and this really gets to me, uh, well I'll do it this way first. Some people, because I hear this all the time, uh, my arthritis is acting up. Now, my arthritis, now arthritis is a disease. So it's not like something we really want, it's a disease. Think about it, dis-ease, it doesn't even sound good, okay? So why would we wanna own it and say that it's mine? But we do things like that all the time. You know, my headache is a problem, my. Anytime you put my in front of it, that means you possess it. So you need to work on just cutting that out. Now, another thing that we do, we do things sometimes as inferences, um, and we feel like, well, we're not really saying that, but we're inferring it. It is just as dangerous. For instance, you may hear somebody say, well, cancer runs in my family. So, you know, I went to the doctor, uh-uh. That's an inference, okay? The inference is since cancer runs in your family, like this would be one of those word, <laughs> word problems on an SAT or something, okay? The inference is since you're saying that cancer runs in your family, the probability is that you should have it because it runs in your family. But I thought that when you were born again, that you were redeemed from what runs in your family because you now
now are in the family of God. So yes, you may have a genetic disposition, but you've been redeemed from anything in that genetic disposition that does not line up with the word of God. So therefore, you shouldn't say things like, this runs in my family. Is it in, does it run in the family of God? Because in the family of God, we have what? Divine health. Cancer does not exist in the family of God. No disease exists there because it's already been bought and paid for by the wounds of Jesus. The blood that he shed took care of that. So therefore, don't say what runs in your family unless you're talking about the family of God and then the only thing that runs in there is prosperity, is health, is healing. I mean, it's a whole totally different conversation. Another thing, and this is really good for anybody who's, well, it's not just for students, but especially for students, but if you're trying to learn something even new on your job, because we know <laughs> that there are different skill sets. Like say, for instance, you may be great at doing your job, but then they bring in a new computer program. That's something different than what you're accustomed to, so that means you've got to learn that skill set. Don't sit there and say things like, I'm trying, but I just don't get it. I can't understand it. The moment you say that, you are never gonna get it, you're never gonna understand it, and you know what? You're setting yourself up to be placed in a position where they'll get someone else who can. The other thing, and this is something that is really, really pressing for a lot of people, everyone has a story to tell. And we've all gone through challenges, and we've gone through some things where we may have had to forgive some people because you know, it was a, a rough experience. Don't sit and say, and people do this sometimes, it was just awful what I went through. I'll never forget it. I'll never get over it. The moment you say that, it's going to be with you for the rest of your life. And that's not what you ever want. You want to get over it. You want to get, rid, get over it as soon as possible. But that's a decision. It's literally a choice. But you need to do that so that you're not blocking any blessings or communication. You're not doing it even so much for the other person. You're doing it for yourself. But you've got to watch the words that you say that come out of your mouth. The other thing that really gets to me, and this is a pet peeve, all of my children know this, they know this is almost like saying a bad word to me when you say, I can't afford it. Don't you dare say that to me. Because the reason why, I may not have the money in my hands at the moment. Notice the words I'm choosing to say. In my hands at the moment, because money coming to me now for whatever it is that I need and for whatever it is that I desire because he gives me the desires of my heart as I delight myself in him. So don't tell me I can't afford it because what you don't realize is once you start putting that out there, the enemy will make sure that you won't even be able to go and afford a can of soup, okay? Because he will say, oh, that's right, you can't afford it. So we have to be so careful. Another thing that gets to me is people talk about what they wish. Like we have this cruise that's coming up in August. And it's something that costs more than, you know, like $100 to go. So, so people will sit up and go, well, I wish I could go on it. Or I wish I could have a nice vacation. Or I wish I could move into that apartment across town. Well, here's the thing. Wishing is, I guess, wonderful, it's okay, it's nice in greeting cards, but I don't see where wishing is mentioned in the Word of God as a viable option for something that you want to happen in your life. But I know faith is. So if we have faith to be able to go on the cruise, if we exercise our faith to move across town, we can move and instead of just renting an apartment, maybe we can just go ahead and buy a condo if we choose to exercise our faith. But again, you have to know what's in the word, but you've got to speak what's in it. Now you hear all the time at the end, again, at the end, whenever I have a benediction, I always say that wherever you are, God is. So think about that for a minute. If wherever you are, God is. That's not a funny thing. That's real. God is within you. So therefore, when you speak, who's speaking? God. So is God going to say you can't afford it? Is God going to say, well, you should wish for something? Or is God going to speak into existence what it is 
that you are believing for, that you need, or that you want. The point is, if you don't know that, that's another trick of the enemy. You don't know it and you just go running off at the mouth and you don't even necessarily realize what you're saying. And then you can't figure out why you're not having the victory in your life that you are believing God for and then you blame it on God. It's not him. It's something we have to think about. Now, I told you how uh, last week, because this I do hear people say a lot about how they're having a senior moment. And that really kind of challenges, I have a challenge with that because, and I shared with you, because Minister Scott has already, I learned this from him, that if we are in fact as old as the universe and as young as a brand new day, where does senior moment fit in that? It doesn't. So just if you hear that or if you got caught up in saying it because it sounds cute, throw it out. It's not a good thing, okay? Because there is no such thing as a senior moment. Now, if you want to say I'm seasoned, but that's not even, that's, it's not meant in a negative way, okay? So just don't say it. Don't say that you forget everything. You don't forget everything, okay? And work on that. Speak to your mind and tell your mind that's as sharp as a tack. Tell your mind that I can remember everything the same way I did 50 years ago or 20 years ago or whatever. Speak to the situation. Don't just sit there and accept Oh, well. No, it's not oh, well. Talk to your body and make it line up with what the Word of God says. But you got, see, that's the real, that's the real trick in all this. People feel foolish speaking to things. You know, they feel foolish speaking to their bank account. They feel foolish speaking to a cut that they have on their hand because that's what the world has made you believe. But I thought that we were in this world, but we weren't of it. So if you're not of it, then don't go by their rules. So speak to the situation, whatever it is, and watch it change because again, when you're speaking, so who's speaking? God, okay. Here's another thing that really, really, and this is where exactly where I left off last week. You will hear people say marriage is a lot of work. I hear that all the time, and I hear it from believers, and that really gets to me, okay? Because what I don't understand is why would, it be a lot, why would marriage be a lot of work any different than if you're in a relationship with your best friend, whoever that may be, or uh, I don't know, a colleague that you have at work? Do you consider those relationships a lot of work? So then why would marriage be a lot of work? Now I understand that you don't live with your best friend necessarily or live with your colleagues, so you do have that space, I get all that. However, when you chose to marry whomever you chose to marry, the two of you became one. So if the two of you became one, I mean, how much space do you really need? You should have thought about that perhaps before you said those vows and became one. But to say that it's a lot of work, don't you think you're setting yourself up to it becoming a lot of work? Okay, there may be times that you may have some intense fellowship and you may not be on the same page all the time, that's because you are both bringing two different things to a situation, and that's good, because if not, it would be rather boring. But the point is, to sit up and say it's a lot of work, that's one of those things like senior moment, if you've ever said it, stop, because it should not be work. The other thing that a lot of people are falling into, because it's the young phrase that's out, we get so caught up sometimes and don't even realize it. That's the thing, TV and commercials, they're subliminal. And before you even realize, you start saying some of the same stuff those people say, and you don't even realize you're doing it. One of those things that gets to me is date night. Okay, I'm married and I gotta have a date night. And you know, we haven't had a date night in a long time, child, and I think that's what the problem is, okay. On August, uh, on April 24th, 1974, at about 3.40, because my wedding started at 3.30, I started a date. And that date goes into eternity. So for me, I don't need a date night. I'm on a date all the time. And I think if you look, I'm so serious though. I mean, I'm not even trying to be funny. That's really how I look at it. I mean, I get to have breakfast dates, lunch dates, 
dinner, dates, all kinds of stuff. I mean, and all kinds of other things. <laughs> but my point is, why do I need a date night? You see, these are subtle things that trip people up. Because what happens if you don't get a date night? He forgot about me, or she didn't do this. And it just, it's another thought, idea, and suggestion that the enemy has allowed the world to do. They can do what they want. But now we're picking up on it. And I just don't think it's good. Now, of course, it's wonderful to go out to a special dinner where maybe you, you know, get gussied up or dress up a little extra. But that's not a date night. That just means that if you're doing it, the other one is doing it. Meaning if I'm gonna get extra dressed, then I expect Stan is gonna get extra dressed. He's not gonna go show up in a, you know, jogging suit and Nikes if I'm getting dressed up. We're both getting dressed up. So is it really a date night? No, it just means we're going out and we got dressed up. The point that I'm making is that's another one of those inferences that you've got to be careful about. Because if you're not, you start to have all kinds of things go in your head that don't add up with the word or don't line up with the word. Just like Valentine's Day, there are people all over America, believers, who were depressed on Valentine's Day because they didn't get a valentine. They didn't get any flowers, they didn't get hearts of candy or whatever else they're telling you you're supposed to have. Which to me, I, I have a weird way of thinking because we don't celebrate, Valentine's Day is every day for me, okay? And I remember telling my husband early on, don't you dare go buy me no box of candy and spend all that money. You wait till the day after Valentine's Day where everything is, because, and that's because in my mind, I'm like, why should we spend on candy? Are you kidding? I love chocolate anytime. Bring it to me any day. Okay, so it doesn't have to be a set day. I don't want the world telling me when you are supposed to, you should celebrate me every day that I live. And vice versa. So therefore, there's no pressure. But do you see what I'm saying? It's like we're getting sucked in and we're not realizing that we are. And we've got to watch that. Teenage years are the worst. Has anybody ever heard that? Now, I will admit, teenage years are challenging. Infancy is fun, <laughs> okay? Because infancy, they just lay there, you know, you change their diaper, dress them up, they're cute, they're like little dolls, they don't have much to say, it's wonderful. The only thing is they rob you of sleep, but other than that, it's easy. Yes, I will admit, teenage years can be challenging, but notice I said challenge and I didn't say problem because we don't have problems when we are in the kingdom of God. We have challenges, but we already have the answer to our challenges in the word. And if we speak to those teenagers and speak to what's going on in their life, it makes a difference. Now, I will give you a little tidbit. Sometimes you have to speak to teenagers when they're asleep. <laughs> Here's what I mean by that. Because sometimes they, they really can challenge you, really challenge you. But when they're sleeping, they're asleep. So I would go in my children's rooms while they were asleep, and I would speak the word over them while they slept. This way, I didn't have to deal with the challenge of, oh my goodness, they're going to say something, and I'm going to have to deal with that. I didn't have to go through that. And it was just wonderful, because whether they realized it or not, the word was being imparted into them, and it makes a difference. So. You know, I didn't have any terrible twos with my children because I believed, I started confessing as soon as they started walking. Oh, you're going to be such a blessing when you're two years old because everybody kept saying the terrible twos. And I didn't want to have terrible twos. I didn't have to child-proof my house. I didn't go through all of this stuff. We just spoke the word and it works. But if you don't know to do it and if you don't govern it and watch your mouth, again, you are going to eat the fruit of what it is that you say. Turn with me to the book of Proverbs, the 13th chapter, and we're gonna look at the second and third verse. Proverbs 13, and as I've said to you before, we're gonna spend a lot of time in Psalms and Proverbs, and I explained to you why before, so if you don't know, turn on the podcast if you're in Ministry of Helps, or get a CD, because I don't have time to go back through it all again. But anyway, Proverbs 13, are you there? Okay, great. So we're gonna look at it first out of the New King James Version and it says, a man shall eat well by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the unfaithful <laughs> feeds on violence. He who guards his mouth preserves his life, 
but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. I think that's really pretty clear. If we look at it in the Living Bible, it says, the good man wins his case by careful argument. The evil-minded only wants to fight. Self-control means controlling the tongue. A quick retort can ruin everything. Now, we know that. Because sometimes, you know, you say something and you wish, I shouldn't have said that. You know, we've all had that, shouldn't have said that moment. Okay, well, it can ruin a whole entire situation or it can create intense fellowship just because you should have just not said that one thing. If we look at this in the easy to read, it says, people get good things for the words they say, but those who cannot be trusted say only bad things. People who are careful about what they say will save their lives, but those who speak without thinking will be destroyed. The message says the good acquire a taste for helpful conversation. Bullies push and shove their way through life. Careful words make for a careful life. Careless talk <laughs> may ruin everything. And you know, we can think of people that we know now who sometimes if they would just not talk so much or maybe if they'd stop tweeting so many words, things could be a little bit different all the way around. So we have to be, well, I'm just, <laughs> That was subtle, <laughs> but, but still there. Okay, you're in Proverbs. Uh, look at, turn over to the fourth chapter. Just go right over to Proverbs 4, and we're going to look at verses 20 through 27. And it says, my son, out of the New King James Version, it says, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. I'm going to pause there. That is so important. The word of God is health to all your flesh. Sometimes you may be in the midst of a physical attack and you need to go and put on a word CD. Let the word, even if you just are sitting there, just let the word, just let it feed your spirit because it is truly health to all your flesh. The same thing with the music ministry, word music ministry. I'm not talking about, you know, some of the other stuff that's out there. That's okay, but I'm talking about the word. Let that just seep into you. Another thing, if anybody has small children, if you could let them get up in the morning as they're preparing for school and you put on a music CD of the word, and let them go to school. Just let it play in the background as you're doing everything and fixing breakfast or whatever you're doing. You will see an increase in how well they do in school. I'm telling you this because I did it. I did it with two teenage boys. Because you know how boys are a little bit more rambunctious than girls? So my ruling was when you get up in the morning, because I never wanted to be a parent that was not realistic or authentic. I knew once they went to school, they were gonna listen to whatever was out, you know, all the different things that were out. You know, like now, I don't know what kids would listen to. Jay-Z, Beyonce, all that stuff is out there. So to make it sound like your kids should never listen to it, that's unrealistic, it's not being authentic. But to start their day, with praise, that you can do, that you can control. And it makes a difference in their whole countenance because what they don't even maybe pick up, well, if you're training them, they do, but they are receiving the word. So they're going out into the world being infused with the word. And it makes a difference in the words that come out of their mouth, in the decisions that they make. So that's something that you can do. So it's just another little thing, but we need to do stuff like that. So picking up on verse 23 in Proverbs, the fourth chapter, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids, your eyelids rather, look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or the left. Remove your foot from evil. If we look at it in the easy to read, it breaks it down this way. My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Don't let them out of your sight. Never stop thinking about them. These words are the secret of life and health to all who discover them. Above all, be careful what you think because your thoughts 
control your life. Why is that? I'll pause here. Why do our thoughts control our life? Quite simple, because our thoughts affect our belief system, our belief system affect our actions, our actions and belief system affect the words that come out of our mouth. Starting with verse 24, don't bend the truth to say things <laughs> that you know are not right. Keep your eyes on the path and look straight ahead. Make sure you are going the right way and nothing will make you fall. Don't go to the right or to the left and you will stay away from evil. Um, the Living Bible, listen, son of mine, to what I say. Listen carefully. Keep these thoughts ever in mind. Let them penetrate deep within your heart for they will mean real life for you and radiant health. Above all else, guard your affections, for they influence everything else in your life. Spurn the careless kiss of a prostitute. Stay far from her. Look straight ahead. Don't even turn your head to look. Watch your step. Stick to the path and be safe. Don't sidetrack. Pull back your foot from danger. And lastly, the message says it this way. Dear friend, listen well to my words. Tune your ears to my voice. Keep my message in plain view at all times. Concentrate. Learn it by heart. And he's talking about the word. We need to learn it by heart. Those who discover these words live, really live, body and soul. They're bursting with health. Keep vigilant watch over your heart. That's where life starts. Don't talk out of both sides of your mouth. Avoid careless banter, white lies, and gossip. Keep your eyes straight ahead. Ignore all sideshow distractions. Watch your step, and the road will stretch out smooth before you. Look neither right nor left. Leave evil in the dust. We must be diligent with our words because they have a direct effect on our lives. Because again, we eat the fruit of our lips. Now you're in Proverbs, so just go right on over to Proverbs 15. And we're going to look at verse 2. Proverbs 15, verse 2. And let's read the second verse out of the New King James Version together. Are you there yet? Yes. Okay, ready? Read. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. That's pretty clear. The easy to read says, listening to wise people increases your knowledge, but only nonsense comes from the mouths of fools. That's why you don't ever, it's, it's really something when you call somebody a fool. I don't think people even realize that. When you call somebody a fool, what's attached to that means that nonsense is what's coming out of their mouth. So you have to be very careful if you use that term, just as something to think about. Um, the Amplified puts it this way, the tongue of the wise speaks knowledge that is pleasing and acceptable, but the babbling mouth of fools spouts folly. So we definitely don't ever want to be considered a fool. Now while you're there, just drop down to verse 4. So this is Proverbs 15, 4. A wholesome tongue, out of the New King James Version, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but <laughs> perverseness in it breaks the spirit. That's true. We look at it in the easy to read. Kind words are like a life-giving tree, but lying words will crush your spirit. Now that I'm sure all of us can agree with at some point. The Amplified says, a soothing tongue. What does that mean? Speaking words that build up and encourage. That's what a soothing tongue is. It's a tree of life, but a perversive tongue, what is that? Speaking words that overwhelm and depress crushes the spirit. Same chapter, let's move down to verse 14. New King James Version. The heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge, but the mouth of fools feeds on foolishness. Easy to read. Intelligent people want more knowledge, but fools only want more nonsense. Now here, I'm going to pause with that. Intelligent people want more knowledge, but fools only want more nonsense. Something to think about with that. When you really spend some time with someone who is extremely intelligent. What are the things that they do in their spare time? Do you find that they're maybe picking up a book to read it? Or they're picking up the Bible that's got their whole entire inheritance in it and they want to know what it is? 
Or are they spending a whole lot of time seeing uh, shows on TV that they think are fun? You know, like spending a ridiculous amount of time looking at TV. Um, TV is getting to a point where it's creating a lot of challenge for a lot of people, even believers, because they'll get caught up in a TV show and, oh yeah, I was gonna study, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that, I'll get to that, I'll get to that. And they find that they might read a few verses and they pat themselves on the back and they feel like they've done something. Okay, that's real nice, you got to look at whatever you want to look at on TV, The Bachelor or whatever's on, I don't even know. Whatever stuff is on, okay? People get all caught up in that, but here's the thing. When you are in the midst of a challenge and you feel like football cleats are pounding your chest at three o'clock in the morning, what is that TV show gonna do for you? Absolutely nothing. But if you would have spent a little time where your spirit is being built up by reading or by doing something that is going to help you, you would find yourself being a lot better off. And these are things we know, we all know this, but it's just one of these, this is, I think the whole, this whole message is to just kind of remind us we need to change some things. We have to really just kind of rein ourselves in. You know, it's like we're, we're, we're pulling our own coat, so to speak. I mean, because if you sit and you, eat, I will say this, intelligent people, even the shows they look at on TV are intelligent TV shows. I mean, you'll find that they do things like look at documentaries where we're like, what, who wants to look at that? But that's what they do. They feed on things that are intelligent. Just like if you go and you talk to billionaires and you ask them about how do they handle their finances. And when they're sitting around the dinner table talking to their children, what are the things that they're talking about? They are talking about um, how to shelter income. They're talking about different tax structures. That's their conversation. They're not sitting talking about, oh, did you see so-and-so who was down at the club last week and blah, blah, blah. That's not coming out of their mouth because that's what? Foolishness. We have to think about again, watching our mouths with everything we say because it makes such a difference. I'm, I guarantee you, if we were to ask Minister Baltimore Scott, what do you do in your spare time? I don't think we would find that he's doing a lot of foolish things, which is why he can get up here and quote all of these people that many of us never even heard of before, okay? I'm serious, but it's because he spent the time in putting that into himself, or otherwise he wouldn't be able to give it to us, amen? Okay, so if we look at this in Proverbs, the Amplified, Proverbs 15, 14, the Amplified says it this way, the mind of the intelligent and discerning seeks knowledge and eagerly inquires after it, but the mouth of the stubborn fool feeds on foolishness. So none of us are gonna be that way, praise God. So just go right down, same chapter, to the 21st verse, New King James Version. Folly is joy to him who is destitute of discernment. That's really good, destitute of discernment. But a man of understanding walks uprightly. The easy to read says, doing foolish things makes a fool happy. But a wise person is careful to do what is right. And the Amplified says, foolishness is joy to him who is without heart and lacks what? Intelligent, common sense. But a man of understanding walks up rightly, making his course straight. Now we're gonna look at the 23rd verse. I know it looks like we're really just devouring this chapter, but it's because the verses are perfect. The 23rd verse says, in the New King James Version, a man has joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. Now think about that, in due season, sometimes you might need to hold your tongue on something. You may observe something and you may know that it's a clear observation, but that doesn't mean that you need to speak it to another person at that time. Maybe you need to wait until the due season because in the due season, they'll be able to receive it. In the due season, it will be encouraging to them. In the due season, you will be building them up. Whereas if you just go say it when you discover it and you think you're so great because you figured it out, you could actually be harming them. So again, you have to watch your mouth. Um, looking at this in the easy to read, it says, people are happy 
when they give a good answer, and there is nothing better than the right word when at the right time. The Amplified, a man has joy in giving an appropriate answer. And how good and delightful is a word spoken at the right moment. How good it is. And all of us do feel good when we share something with someone and we see that it's being a blessing to them and edifying them. We feel good about that too. So again, that's a good thing. If you look at, drop down to verse 26. The thoughts, this is New King James, the thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant. The easy to read says the Lord hates evil thoughts, but he is pleased with kind words. That right there should be enough to let us know that we really just want to speak kind words. The Amplified says evil plans and thoughts are of the wicked, no, excuse me, evil plans and thoughts of the wicked are exceedingly vile and offensive to the Lord, but pure words are pleasant words to him. And think about that. If we are made in his image and his likeness, how does he speak to us? He speaks to us kindly, lovingly, pleasantly. So why shouldn't we want to do that all the time? If we're speaking anything that's not that way and we're not speaking it in that manner, then that's not a good thing. And again, we need to put a check on that. And the other thing that's so wonderful about our Heavenly Father is his timing is perfect. He, think about it, he created us. So he knows everything, even before we say it, he already knows it. Sometimes we do have some thoughts that don't line up and that aren't right. He loves us in spite of that. But the point is, even when he is chastening us, even when he is correcting us, he does it in a loving manner, in a sweet, kind manner. And he does it when we can best receive it. Not always when, you know, it might not be at that exact moment, but when we can best receive it. So we can learn from that example ourselves. Um, the heart, the Amplified says it this way. The heart, oh no, let me do it this way. Go to 28. Just skip right down to 28. This is going to be the last one out of this particular chapter. I know you're glad. Um, so Proverbs 15, 28, the New King James Version says this. The heart of the righteous studies how to answer. But the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. Now, we can all relate to people we know who just say anything that they think of. It just comes right on out. They don't give any discernment at all. They just spout it out, okay? I don't, I don't want to think that they're just being evil, but the point is we have to be discerning with everything that we do, especially our words. The easy to read version says, good people think before they answer. But the wicked do not. And what they say causes trouble. Hmm. Again, that, because we live in an age of social media, so tweeting is something that people have a tendency to do. And again, they don't think before they just start writing out their little tweets. And it creates all kinds of challenges. And in this country, it creates challenges that are affecting worldwide instances. So the point is, again, good people think before they answer. Proverbs says it this way, the heart of the righteous thinks carefully about how to answer. Here's the qualifier, in a wise and appropriate and timely way. But the babbling mouth of the wicked pours out malevolent things. So obviously, we don't want to be like that. Now, as believers, we have to remain faithful to God, even when evil seems to be winning. The ultimate victory is the Lord's and those who belong to him. But you've got to know that. You've got to walk in that. You've got to own that. Turn with me now to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. And let me know that you're there. And we're just going to look at two little verses, 30 and 31. You there? Great. Okay. The New King James Version says it this way. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom, and his tongue talks of justice. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The Living Bible says the godly man is a good counselor because he is just and fair and knows right from wrong. Because that's important, too. 
You've got to know right from wrong. And that's the other reason why here we constantly encourage everybody to be filled with the Holy Spirit, evidenced by speaking with other tongues so that you can rightly divide the word of God. Because you can read the Bible and wrongly divide it because you don't understand it because you don't have that infilling of the Holy Spirit. So that's why it's so important that you have it to overflowing so that you can rightly divide it. Okay, if we look at this in the New International Version, it says, the mouths of the righteous utter wisdom, and their tongues speak what is just. The law of their God is in their hearts. Their feet do not slip. And lastly, the message says, righteous choose on wisdom like a dog on a bone. <laughs> Rolls virtue around on his tongue. His heart pumps God's word like blood through his veins, and his feet are as sure as a cat's. This is why I like the different translations because when you sit and you read it, you get the picture when you think about righteous <laughs> shoes on wisdom like, dog, like a dog on a bone. You get that, you get it. So I really, really like that. Anyway, the point being is to be successful in monitoring the powerful words that proceed from our mouths, we must know and utilize what? The word of God. Because if you don't, then unfortunately, <laughs> there's not a lot that you're going to be able to lend properly to any conversation. Turn with me to the book of Joshua. I'm sure everybody is very familiar with this verse of scripture. Joshua 1.8. You might even have this completely committed to memory. Joshua 1.8. Are you there? Okay. The New King James Version says this, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. The Living Bible says, constantly remind the people about these laws, and you yourself must think about them every day and every night, so that you will be sure to obey all of them, for only then will you succeed. And only next time will I be able to continue, because I've just run out of time. Thanks for joining us. Our hope is that you received something that you can apply to your life and strengthen your faith. At Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, we believe that the Word of God is practical for everyday application. If you'd like to support the ministry with your tithe and offering, you can mail them to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. Thanks again for watching. And remember, we walk by faith not by sight.